Of course, you know, I go from Orthodox Nationalist to Orthodox Nationalist movement uh, around Europe and elsewhere and try to understand the ideology and the mentality behind it. Um, and of course, it's my big, it's my big thing, and I'm, I'm uh, the dominant scholar by far uh, in this field, because in academia, of course, it's, it's not, it's not scholarship; it's just, it's nonsensical, uh, dishonest propaganda. So it was about. Uh, I was still the editor of the Barnes Review, and both Mike Piper and Willis Carter were still alive, and I, um, I decided I was going to write on the Greek military junta, the. Um, the Greek military government of 1967, and that fell in 1974. And as always, uh, everything we're told about it is not true. Every slogan, every kind of, you know, cliche about it is utterly false. And, but to add to this, I realized that Cyprus, which is one of the few countries other than Montenegro, and Russia, I guess, under Patriarch Filaret, after the time of troubles, was a, a country that was directly ruled by a bishop. In this case, we're talking about Archbishop Makarios III, who uh, was a very, very good man. I want to say, I want to say um, at the outset that all the factions here in Greece were decent men. The military most certainly were. The guerrilla groups in Cyprus most certainly were. Makarios III certainly was. All the factions that were to be brought to bear on Cyprus, uh, these weren't bad guys. They had differences in specific areas, very specific areas. The Greek military government took over in 67, around the same time that the fighting broke out in Cyprus. When the Turks invaded Cyprus in 1974, that was the very year the junta fell. Clearly, it's um, connected. So let's go to the background here. First of all, the situation in Greece. Remember, the United States was never anti-communist. It certainly was very pro-Stalinist. Um, and Stalin realized that his reach, he would be permitted to reach as far as he wanted. Now, later presidents thought better of that and said, without any reference to the ideology, that it was simply getting too big. In Vietnam and Korea, as I've said many times, just the notion that the West began getting nervous that this is a massive empire. And it didn't matter what ideology it ran on, it was too big. Great Britain tolerates no um, no rival, no matter what the ideology is. So, generally speaking, of course, trade was brisk with the Soviet Union. The um, West built it and rebuilt it and rebuilt it and bailed the country out over and over again, knowing full well what it was doing. The U.S. lost in Vietnam and Korea, largely because the U.S. was financing the Soviet Union that then financed these um, these other forces. Greece, however, was a tough nut to crack. We're talking in the late 40s, early 50s, Stalin and the communist world backed a communist faction that was finally defeated by a coalition of anti-communist forces of all, of all types. Throughout this conflict, inflation goes through the roof. Um, the Stalinists were really only able to field an army of about 10,000 men, mostly foreign, Lavishly funded from abroad, uh, Yugoslavia and the USSR cooperated in this particular respect. But then, when Stalin broke with Belgrade, their funding was cut off, and their organizations collapsed, which, by the way, proves that they really had no popular support. Greece was a major prize for Stalin. It was very strategic, possessed great wealth, and Stalin knew that the West supported him, and at the time this is going on, the West is financing the rebuilding of the Soviet Union. The Marshall Plan was rejected by Stalin because it would have forced all of these receipts and, and facts to come to light. They didn't want to turn their books over. So rather than simply deny them funding, the U.S. created a new plan tailored just to the USSR. Um, but it was very clear that the Western powers were not willing to see Stalin go anywhere he wanted. Again, this isn't because they were anti-communist that they even knew what communism was. It was simply getting too large. When the anti-communists took over, the Greek Stalinists were banned and many were forced to leave the country. Western newspapers said that this was a persecution of the communists and um, said that the communists were acting only in self-defense. But the Greek military, as it turns out, is a conservative institution, unlike the American military. But it was clear that all the officers were not. 
the top brass of the, of the armed forces were conservative in general. They cut their teeth fighting Stalin in, in, um, in the Civil War right after the Second World War. And by the early 1960s, after a series of vaguely a-ideological, vaguely conservative governments, uh, the National Radical Union, which was very anti-communist, liberal Republican was elected, the ill-fated uh, George Papandreou. And then George Lambrakis, who was a strange bird because he was a pacifist, who, of course, like all pacifists, has no problem when the left is violent. Pacifists are really just a problem when right-wingers are violent. So Lambrakis had no problem with Stalin's aggression. But when he died, uh, was assassinated, in fact, his funeral became a mobilizing arena for the far left in Greece. And the next round of elections, with a lot of funding from Great Britain, led, led to somewhat of a, a vaguely liberal parliament. And I'm saying vaguely on purpose, because before military takes over in a country, and this is always the case, the parliament of the country has been totally and uh, completely um, uh, stagnant and, and paralyzed. There's violence in the streets. There's no ruling ideology. There's no ruling identity anymore. And the country's falling to pieces. After the funeral, the Greek military needed to deal with violent demonstrations. These were not exactly representative populations, but they were all financed from abroad. It was a constitutional crisis that developed uh, under the young, very conservative, but very inexperienced King Constantine II. At some point um, in the 60s, uh, the king brought down Papandreou's government, but failed to create one of his own. I'm going through this very, very quickly. Uh, in Greek politics, essentially, the king had full charge of the army, which, of course, for the left was a big problem, but in foreign policy and other things were in the hands of the legislature. Uh, Papandreou, angry and very anti-royalist, demanded to be po- appointed defense minister, hoping to take over the army and turning it towards the USSR and the left in general. And then as the early 60s, mid-60s were on, street protests grow larger, and you, know, you end up with these things, uh, no ideology, you know, there's a 50-50 split in the legislature, nothing is getting done, Greece is collapsing. No government can get a vote of confidence, the Greek economy began to collapse. By 1967, the governments were lasting maybe a week, like the Italians, although without the economic success, poverty, hyperinflation, unemployment, investment was drying up, interest rates went through the roof, money shifted to international bonds. But then the liberals formed an alliance with the communists, which, by the way, were banned because the USSR was financing the, the socialists and global Marxism was financing them too. They simply changed their name. And since no party could form a government alone, this solution was taken seriously. So a real communist takeover, all of a sudden in 67, becomes very real. And this is, by the way, right in the middle of Mao Zedong's cultural revolution. Democracy had failed, as it always does. You had a split population, decline in public morals, failing economy, strike, street protests, squabbling politicians, pompous speech-making, institutionalized lying, threats, and all of these typical liberal democratic uh, consequences. Military took over on April 21st, 1967, to the cheers of everyone in Greece except the communists. They couldn't take it anymore. These politicians were arrested en masse as the beneficiaries of Greek poverty and misery. And you know, most of these officers who took over were colonels, lieutenant colonels and colonels. Uh, the two colonels were the, were the leaders. Nicholas Mazurekos, the undisputed leader, and George Papadopoulos, who was the chief leader. And um, Patankos, Dalianos Patankos, was one uh, general, brigadier, but he was a minor figure. The colonels ran the show. These men were populist by conviction. They saw this as a crisis coming from corrupt politicians and arrogant bankers. Papadopoulos came from a peasant family. Most of these guys did. Uh, and the king, though a good man, was way too inexperienced for this. Papadopoulos said he's simply too young for the job. But the colonels supported monarchy, just not him. They looked at the city. These were peasant kids who did well in the army. And they were populists. They saw you know, Greece as an agricultural peasant society. And it was a city 
the basis of corruption, big money. And of course, you know, your ruling class usually comes from the cities. And as is also often the case, the military really didn't know how to wage a propaganda war. Um, but, you know, true to their populism, the first to be arrested was a chief of the army, who was a very liberal cosmopolitan figure, um, uh, who was, uh, I, I believe he was higher than a brigadier. He may have been a lieutenant general. Spentadakis. George Spentadakis. Now, the Greek military coup and the Cyprus problem is never dealt with outside of Greece amongst nationalists. So please someone tell Golden Dawn, who are my friends and whom I love dearly, that an Irishman from New Jersey finally is taking these issues very seriously. I'm one of these strange birds that support both the Greek military government and Makadios III. Um, the military was simply wrong when it came to just one issue, which we'll get to here in a minute. Of course, the U.S. immediately condemned the coup. They called it a rape of democracy. Contrary to popular belief, the U.S. government never once ever supported a military coup in the post-war era. But in Greece, it was no different. The coup itself was mostly low-level officers that were rejected by the upper brass, hated the politician, and as these guys are thrown in jail, all but the communists and the British are cheering for them. Essentially, they uh, arrest, arrested the generals. They arrested the elites. A military and political move with, with tremendous effect. The exact same happened we've talked about it on this show with uh, General Chung Hee Park in South Korea. It's not going to be an oligarchy anymore. In both cases, the policies that these men instituted worked, as they always do, under most circumstances. And the tragedy here is that the king was a bit befuddled, he was isolated, and he had to legalize the military government, which, again, with Constantine's support, however coerced it was, it um, it just made the military government all the more popular. But the monarchy did oust the colonels from power. Uh, short time after the coup, Constantine was to fly to Salonika, which was, by the way, the Jewish capital of the Balkans, with a small military force loyal to him. As always, the Navy and Air Force supported the, the left at the higher levels, and the king wanted to create an alternative northern government and receive international recognition, especially from the British. But the army was simply, couldn't be trusted by anyone on the left. Um, lower-level officers simply refused to listen, and the king failed. Lower-level officers are arresting generals and took over full units, whole units because these generals were political appointees, they were liberals, they were in the pay, of whether it be the Lodge or London, which is, I guess, one and the same. And don't forget, you know, even mainstream historians will fully admit that the Masons were all over the elite in Greece at the time. Now, it's widely admitted the CIA put a lot of money into Constantine's movement. Um, and U.S. foreign policy, they always hated military governments, contrary to myth. But like in places like El Salvador, they wanted to split the difference between the two extremes and support moderate liberal party. So on the one hand, finance doesn't really like nationalist movements and never will. But they are enamored with Marxism. Unfortunately, in the developing world, unfortunately Greece was in that boat, nationalism becomes national socialism real fast. So the regime usually puts its bet in the center, um, worried about some kind of expropriation of capital. Um, the name the colonels gave to themselves was not real rhetoric. It's the Revolutionary Council. They were ideologically driven. The military saw the, the despoliation of labor and agriculture. Liberal economic policies were, were an utter disaster. But even, even a hostile critic of the Hunter says this, to gain support for his rule, Papadopoulos was able to project an image that appealed to some segments of Greece. The son of a poor family from a rural area, he had no education other than the military academy, and he publicly stated utter contempt for urban Western educated elites, which he puts in quotes, by the way, in Athens. Modern Western music was banned from the airwaves and folk music and the arts were promoted. This is supposed to be a bad thing. Now, I don't know why he has the word elite in quotes, was he denying that they existed? Their base of power, of course, was orthodoxy, the peasantry, 
labor. Papadopoulos was a poor man until he got into the army, kind of a rough way of speaking, and he earned tremendous confidence. Papadopoulos was a man of his word. He realized that there was an immediate connection between democracy and oligarchy. Wherever liberal democracy has been imposed, oligarchy is the result. Yet academics still can't see a connection. It's the ideology of the rich, the official ideology of international finance. It's even the case that maybe in the 1960s, you had plenty in the middle class that realized that a military government was far better than oligarchy. Of course, as is always the case, or almost always the case, the military oversaw an explosion in the Greek economy. It went from, I mean, it was one of the poorest countries in Europe, and you saw stability for the first time. And here, another hostile critic says this, the 1967-73 period was marked by high rates of economic growth, coupled with low inflation and low unemployment. GDP growth was driven by investment in the tourism industry, public spending, and pro-business incentives that fostered both domestic and foreign capital spending. What he doesn't say, of course, is that pro-business incentives refer to Greek businesses, uh, small and medium size, not the conglomerates. The communists were thrown in prison by the hundreds. And, of course, you know, the colonels were very clear. They were going to set up the gulag system in Greece with American support. That's not going to happen now. It's humorous that the, the junta, um, aware of the hippie movement that was developing, uh, that, that finance capital, the Frankfurt School was financing in the U.S., was coming into Greece, all with CIA American money, and these guys went straight to prison. And both Franco in Spain and the Greek colonels in Greece blamed the U.S. policy and the CIA for this invasion of this bizarre phenomenon. But, you know, given the crisis in the country, other than a few drug dealers, few cared or even noticed. The crap that the CIA, the regime, was pouring into Greece was awful. All kinds of, you know, demonic, um, you know, hippie groups, um, claiming to be pacifists, but of course rioting. Um, you know, record companies were, were centralizing power, putting all kinds of, this is why music was so important to the colonels. You know, I've told this story many times before, um, the Black Sabbath was a great band from the early 70s. Never, of course, had any interest in, in Satanism. In fact, Master of Reality is a very Christian album, if you, if you would bother, bother listen to it. Uh, but Tony Naomi from Sabbath always used to say, and still so you can find it on YouTube, where he says, our first album, um, had inverted crosses in it. We didn't put it there. The record company put it there without our knowledge. We were a nobody. We just did what they told us. They demanded that the satanic imagery be imposed on that album. And as a result, Tony, uh, as a great guitar player, always wore a proper gold cross around his neck all the time, and even had it um, embossed into his frets. So this is what the record companies were doing, all coming from the United States. So the music issue was important to the colonels. They, they had folk music and classical stuff, and the new stuff coming from the U.S. was banned. And you know, the fact is no one cared. You know, um, it was it was refreshing and stable and happy. Um, and so the people these guys were throwing in prison were, were drug addicts and you know, the lowest of the population. But that's really a minor issue. During the oligarchy, which some people call democracy, farming was a dangerous occupation. Just like in America today, farmers were going bankrupt in, in huge numbers. And of course, had the uttermost contempt for bankers and leftists. Had no love for the, for the vague conservatives, that the moderates represented by Constantine, or the Revolutionary Council always use them as their base. First thing that the colonels did was cancel all agricultural debt. However, they were careful to distinguish the family farm and the medium-sized businesses from any kind of Western-owned agribusiness. So the maximum amount per holding that could be written off is roughly $100,000, a large amount of money at the time, but still too small for any of the agribusinesses to, to take seriously. So they simply canceled debt. Chongqing Park did the same thing in South Korea. For, as a temporary measure, there was direct cash support to struggling farmers. And it became easier for farming families to send their kids to college. They were given free tuition and free textbooks. Of course, in the United States, textbooks were about $2,000 a semester. And kids are loaded up with debt for an economy that doesn't have any jobs. The growth of conservative students 
with these military scholarships, set the universities absolutely aghast. College was for the rich. Oligarchy, democracy, liberalism, all the same thing. So college students were mobilized and trained to riot. That same thing in South Korea. And as always, you know, these protests would show up, elite kids with their protest signs in English, mysteriously enough, uh, you know, with their slogans and everything else that, you know, had no support in the general population. And tourism, as we mentioned, zero interest loans were granted and the fi- international finance went crazy. For small business startups, um, 0% loans were, were floated, but tourism was a big, a big part of it. Um, the oil shock, of course, hits right around this time, you know, um, when, when the economy is exploding in the 1970s, but this is no fault of the junta. Um, and the oil shock existed in the early 70s as well. But finance is the issue. Greece under the junta was going to back out of the global trading order. They were going to leave NATO. And their greatest sin was they backed a Greek currency, making it non-convertible. So it could not be affected by market pressures, the military control, the currency. Greece was a sovereign state, finally. So Papandreou, the liberal leader from a few years before, who was given uh, an immediate tenure job at Harvard, I don't know why, but that's what he was doing during this period of time. First thing he did after the after the coup collapsed in 74 was run right to the bank and make the currency floatable. In other words, it was vulnerable to outside manipulation. So a, a convertible currency floats with the U.S. dollar, which is another way of saying it was under the American control. But very few people understood that at the time. 1968, January 19th, the CIA issued an intelligence memorandum very hostile to the Greek government. And they say... Corruption is endemic, but NATO went further and wanted Greece to be kicked out of the alliance. The memorandum states that the junta replaced many local officials with military officers, and they were totalitarians. Bizarrely enough, the military and the USSR were considered one and the same, except the USSR was receiving subsidies from the U.S., while the Greeks, well, the Greeks were put under an embargo. Many documents you can get from the CIA, which I did, warn junta members that they're not too take action against the left. Uh, there is a telegram from the embassy in Greece to the Department of State, April 23rd, 1967. And here's section 7. Now that we have the junta's attention, what are we saying? From our vantage point here, what is essential is to get Greece pointed again in the direction of some kind of government with the consent of the governed. Obviously, the military is not about to yield power. Therefore, the question is one of transitional arrangements. One possibility is the like Vietnam pattern a pledge of the new government to proceed towards election of a constituent assembly, which in turn would produce a revised constitution subject to referendum. Another idea is establishment by fiat of a national constitutional council consisting of eminent jurists and others of unquestioned integrity and stature. Whatever the mechanism of out steps toward the restoration of constitutional rule would give the promise way out from the present dictatorial dead end. These kind of memoranda could be found in any military government in, in the post-war world. The U.S. Um, condemned Greece, NATO condemned Greece, and now you had an alliance of the Soviet Union, the left, soon Turkey, London and the U.S., and liberalism in general against the Greek military and government. Now, let's turn to Cyprus. Many of the Members of the coup, the lower-level officers, were from Cyprus. All the issues that were facing the military government, nothing was more deadly and serious than Cyprus. It was the Achilles' heel. It achieved its independence in 1960, but unfortunately had about 20% of its population was Turkish. It had been a British colony up to that point, and it's ruled by Archbishop Makadios III, who was president of the country just prior to independence in 1955, to his death, on on again, off again. The junta went in and out of favor with Makadios and the Cypriot nationalist movement. Um, London was very upset. It saw Cyprus as an important naval base in the east. And Makadios was always seen, generally speaking, as an enemy of Britain. Um, Makadios really, you know, Cyprus, now you have this divided society. He really wanted to exile the Turks, or at least 
grant them minority rights in a unitary state. He wanted no concessions to Turkey. He was anti-Western, anti-liberal. And so the U.S. called him a Marxist, showing that they don't know what Marxism is, as he joined the non-aligned movement. The way, when the State Department calls you a Marxist, what they really mean is that you are a national socialist. These guys couldn't tell you what Marxism was, but they knew what, nas- what a nationalist was. So McConaughey just goes to the non-aligned movement meeting in Belgrade, and the U.S. State Department issued a memorandum calling him the Castro of the Mediterranean. They knew of several assassination attempts, but withheld the information. So NATO was trying to kick out military and try, this is actually before the coup, and NATO was trying to kick out Makarios. So Makarios went to Moscow. He had no interest in, in Moscow, but he knew that he could get support where the West had abandoned him. In a work on the uh, 1967 work, academic work on the, on the topic, when Makarios' stand took a definite anti-NATO form, however, and while a Turkish invasion of the island appeared quite likely, the Soviet government took the diplomatic initiative, hoping to encourage the new republic to be a left-leaning state, completely detached from NATO. Moscow offered Cyprus economic assistance and weapons. In defiance of Athens, right, this is prior to the coup, and to the dismay of the Western world, Makarios' government concluded an agreement in September 1964, under which it received from the Soviet Union, by way of Egypt, quantities of small arms, medium tanks, a few torpedo boats, and anti-aircraft guns. So the fact that many of these guns were probably built with American capital didn't bother them. Now the nationalist group, the guerrilla group that had fought for independence, was called the in, in Greek the EOKA, which in English stands for the National Association of Cypriot Fighters. Um, and they were closely connected with the junta when they took over. Now what they wanted, the Greek term is enosis, with the union of Greece with Cyprus. There were Greek-speaking Orthodox people, why not? The junta wanted it, and the rebels in um, Cyprus wanted it. Now, the Turks wanted something called taksim, which is partition, which is actually what you have today. So, many uh, nationalists formed the Cyprus National Council, which was pro to overthrow Makarios. Now, Makarios came out against Gnosis, and it turns out he was right to, to do this, because he promised the British to reject it in exchange for independence. Enosis was an excellent idea in theory, but the state of the Greek economy before the coup that we just talking about made it less and less attractive. Greece, since 1952, was in NATO, and before the coup under Western control. So for a country that had just thrown off colonial rule, NATO membership meant an alliance with Turkey too. They were not about to go under any international body. Now in 1959, just a year before independence, the Archbishop gained 67% of the vote in the presidential elections. After a few years of fighting in 1968, he won 90%. But I have to note that in 1950, before independence, Cyprus voted overwhelmingly for Enosis in a referendum. But the British squashed this. This is prior to the collapse of the Greek economy. So the fight was between Makarios and the EOKA. And the EOKA also included the junta in Athens. Now these guys agreed on pretty much everything except that. Whether or not there should be a political union or whether Cyprus should maintain its independence, but of course always be allied with Greece. But Makarios maintained a tremendous popularity. The EOKA, while respected, never did well at the polls. The Greek junta made the EOKA part of the National Guard, which was Cyprus's military. Now, the constitution was founded in 1960. It was a disaster. It was imposed on them by the British largely and it established affirmative action as a centerpiece of everything it did. Now, the president was to be a Greek, but the vice president had to be Turkish. Remember, they're about 18% of the population. And those two men could veto each other. The ratio in the army was 60-40, Greek to Turkish, and the civil service it was 70-30. Now, of course, the Turks loved this idea. But they were a poverty-stricken 18% of the economy, but they're to be 40% of the army? Makarios hated this. He hated the veto idea. He saw Cyprus as a single nation, not a federation of two hostile people. He hated the affirmative action idea. He made it clear that it paralyzed government, and he was right. What he wanted to do, if the Turks wouldn't leave, he sought to guarantee Turks minority rights, but their power was to be restricted only to what their numbers and economic contribution could earn. This and only this was workable. But the point was to keep Cyprus poor, to render it nothing more 
than a British base of operations and dependent on the Western world. The same paper I quoted above says this, Given the mood of the two communities at the time, that is to say, Greek and, Greek and Turkish, it's no great surprise that this bizarre arrangement proved unworkable. Within months, government activity had become to, had come to a standstill. To this day, this is 1967, the island remains without vital legislation, including income taxes. The five major towns are without any formal administration. The number of legal cases, there could be no agreement on the court's composition. The civil service is understaffed, partially because the Greeks couldn't come up with people to fill the quota. Now, Makarios is an archbishop. He was an ethno-nationalist. He was an ethnarch, not president. He wanted local assemblies, strong local, local government. He opposed Athens, Turkey, and NATO. Joining with Athens and Enosis would mean that they would be a part of the NATO alliance one way or another. And unfortunately, the Greek military government created protest movements against Makarios every time he won an election. The Americans tilted to Turkey. Turkey was much bigger than Greece, the second largest army in NATO, and it's the only NATO member that actually bordered the USSR. Not to mention, the Israelis loved it, because it was a so-called democratic state in union with the U.S. that then could fight any of the enemies of Israel in the Middle East. In 1974, Roger Davies, the U.S. diplomat, was shot and killed on the island. The press immediately, without any thought, said an EOKA member did it, which makes no sense. All these blaming, uh, you know, some terrorist group for doing these things never makes sense because it would have been suicidal. The U.S. was already against Greek nationalism in all of its forms. Wouldn't this give the U.S. an excuse to destroy it now? Clearly, the only person that, that only group that uh, was that benefited were the Turks. But as a result of all this, no charges were ever filed. 1974, the EOKA, um, you know, the same year the, the coup collapsed. Catastrophe hit. The UK overthrew Makarios. The result was a Turkish invasion. The coup was orchestrated from Athens. Makarios knew that if Enosis were to occur, Turkey would invade the island. The new president was a guy named Nikos Samson. Doesn't sound like a Greek name to me. But whatever pop popularity the EOK had had vaporized after the Turks sent their divisions against the island in Operation Attila. In 1974, he made a speech to the UN, and he said, while he agrees with the Greeks and the military in so many areas, when it comes to Cyprus, they're dead wrong. He called the EOKA terrorist organization. He said, I've been fighting coups and assassination attempts for years, and the coup that overthrew him, he considered an invasion from Greece. And he could prove this because as a, you know, there, there was a fighting uh, during the coup and lots of the dead were Greek regulars in uniform. And Athens had Greek officers at the National Council. He called the coup unpopular, which it was. Given the fact that Turkey was threatening the island, if this happens, we're going to invade. He wanted to talk to Athens because he certainly wanted the military far more than the Turks. And so he compromised and, and they, allow, they allowed him to pick what Greek officers would run the National Guard or the armed forces. The great news, though, is that the first invasion of the Turks was defeated by the tiny National Guard of Cyprus. But the Greek junta still collapsed after the invasion was traced back to them. Once the junta was overthrown, Greeks became far more interested in Turkish demands for negotiations than Turkey and Israel got what they wanted. Greece and Turkey were both members of NATO. One could not get it over on the other since their forces, leadership, and tactics were well known to the other. This is why the junta wanted to leave NATO. Of course, when democracy was restored, the new government changed all this. By the way, I, I, I've heard of no referendum that, that charted this path. You know, they just simply imposed it in the name of democracy. The Turks had been defeated. So in August, they launched yet a second invasion, and here they were angry. They took about 38% of the island, and Turkish behavior here, both with Turkish locals and their own behavior, was abominable. They drove about 53% 50, of the population in Turkish areas, driven them, driven them from their homes, the Greeks. It was pure genocide. Now, maybe it's a coincidence that a year earlier, oil was discovered 
off the coast of the island of Thassos near Cyprus. So now Israel, Britain, and Turkey become very interested in what happens there, and they operated to overthrow the junta in Athens and had the Turks invade Cyprus to ensure their control oil the, over this tremendous uh, oil find in the general area. Britain, as always, supported uh, Islamic and Jewish concerns, and their enemy was Orthodox nationalism. We're going to talk about proof of this here in a minute. Turkey was mobilized. Uh, a writer writes, um, uh, Gufadakis in 1985, says, Another area of Greek miscalculation related to the behavior of the perfidious Albion. In other words, Greeks totally underestimated Britain's capacity to introduce the Turkish factor to fend off Greek pressures over Cyprus and bring reason to Greece, or so he said. Turkey backed British rule, as well as the Israelis did. Orthodox nationalism was a potent enemy, especially Greek. September 6, 1955, ten years earlier, Jewish, British, and Turkish interests organized a pogrom against Greeks in Turkey that received zero media attention. All friendship between Greece and Turks that ever could have existed was destroyed. They needed one side to use against the other. But here's something that has not been discussed, at least not by our people. The Turks, when they invaded the island with American, British, and Israeli assistance, they stripped the place. Cyprus has some of the most extraordinary, priceless icons and artifacts in their churches of any other Orthodox place. They stripped all of these. Jewish art dealers swooped in on uh, coattails of the Turks, and they stole everything that wasn't nailed down. The main company here is Goldberg and Friedman from Indiana in the U.S. They followed the Turks, deliberately destroying churches, melting down gold, and some of these Jews could have made a fortune, but they wanted to destroy the icons due to their hatred for Christianity. In 2002, the BBC wrote an article called The Shame of Cyprus's Looted Churches. They never mentioned Goldberg, but they talked about the criminality of the sale and distribution of these icons. There was a court case that was filed in the American court, and believe it or not, they sided with the Greeks. The Orthodox Church of Cyprus versus Goldman Friedman Fine Arts, LLC, 1990. There's an article on the case in the Journal of International Law, Volume 86. These Jews took millions in gold, jewels. Some of these were even from the 11th century. Believe it or not, the 80s pop singer Boy George somehow got his hands on these. He was in an interview in his home, and a Greek guy saw this icon over his shoulder. He recognized it. He knew it was Cypriot. And this is what launched the court case against these Jews. Now, to his credit, Boy George sent it back to, the, to Cyprus. A Turkish art dealer named Aydin Dikman who was a well-known smuggler. Using the Turkish military, he looted dozens of churches. These were mafiosa. Goldberg, believe it or not, was so outrageous in her behavior that the court in the U.S. came down hard on her. Let me, let me read from the appellate decision in 1990. During the few days that Goldberg waited in Switzerland for the money to arrive from merchants, this was a loan that she had, floated she placed several telephone calls concerning the mosaics. She testified that she wanted to make sure the mosaics had not been reported stolen and that no treaties, treaties would prevent her from selling them. She called UNESCO's office and asked if you know it was okay that these be removed. She claims also to have called on advice from the art dealer of hers in New York, the International Foundation for Art Research, an organization that collects this kind of information. She testified that she asked IFAR whether it had any record of any claim here. When she called back later as instructed, IFAR told her that it did not. The judge in the case rejected this. Judge Nolan clearly doubted the credibility of Goldberg's testimony, noting, among other things, that neither Goldberg had any record of any such search. Judge Nolan questioned Goldberg's testimony that she telephoned custom officials. The only thing which Judge Nolan was sure of, that Goldberg did not contact the Republic of Cyprus in the Church of Cyprus. So, Ozzy Frenzel, another Jew in Merchants Bank, which is Indiana, 
and the other branch of it was in Turkish Cyprus. Um, so it was an Israeli Turkish operation, loaned her several million dollars to finance the looting of these churches. She didn't actually do it. The Turks and others did it, but they, they simply went in and took it. The appellate court in Indiana called Peg Goldberg a liar over and over again. These Jews lie, saying that they accidentally stumbled upon these in a ruined church somewhere. And the, the Greeks were okay with it. The court said hilariously, The court is at a loss to understand how the sales invoice substantiates the defendant's contention that Dickman found the mosaics in the rubble of an extinct, extinct church, and the Turks authorized the export of the mosaic. Also, they were smuggled past Swiss customs on the way to the U.S. The fact is, the Israelis and the British engineered the Turkish invasion of Cyprus, and one of the results was that a bunch of Jewish art dealers went in and simply stripped that part of Cyprus clean of priceless artifacts. The court in Indiana really deserves to be uh, commended here. The judge called her the lowest of scoundrels trying to profit from the invasion of the island. He called her a plunderer of the churches and clearly sided with the Republic of Cyprus trying to find these artifacts back. The judge says, Unfortunately, when these mosaics surfaced, they were in the hands of Peg Goldberg and her gallery. Correctly applying Indiana law, the district court determined that Goldberg must return the mosaics to the Church of Cyprus. Goldberg's tireless attacks have not established reversible error in this determination, and thus, for reasons we've mentioned, the district court's, adju- George court's judgment is affirmed. It doesn't happen every day. Goldberg was humiliated. She was an art thief, in essence. The original lawsuit says this. Goldberg is president of the majority shareholder of Goldberg and Feldman Fine Arts. The co-owner uh, is George Feldman, who serves as vice president in 1981. Goldberg deals in 19th and 20th century art. Has nothing to do with Byzantine art. So it was only because of the, the Israeli involvement in the attack on Cyprus that this criminal had any connection with these at all. And then she had the nerve to say, oh, I fell in love with these artifacts. Now, this obvious lie wasn't refuted, but the judge did call her a little more than a thief. But her, the, the, what she destroyed was not part of, this, uh, part of, the, of the suit. This had not been dealt with um, in our people at all. The Jewish, essentially what is a Jewish invasion of Cyprus, with the explicit desire to strip the churches and then sell them at a huge profit. This is what uh, one of the things that occurred. But the Masons in the Greek church struck back. 1972, they brought Makadios on charges of having a secular position, which he was not allowed to have. He'd been president since 1955. This is 1972. Oh yes, by the way, if this sounds familiar, it is. This was the same canon that I was allegedly charged with um, before I resigned from the Senate, before the uh, trial took place. The three bishops were Gennadius, Athanasius, and Cyprian. I don't know if they were Masons or not. They were certainly doing their bidding. All patriarchs of the world attended the council hearing against Makarios. Uh The ecumenical patriarch, of course, was a Mason and a Turkish citizen, so he refused to go. And, of course, Athens refused to go. The Orthodox world um, sided with Makarios. But these bishops were deep into NATO's pocket. And the fact is, is that masonry is all over the Greek and Cypriot church. Makarios recognized the political nature of this attack. He said a few things. First of all, being president here of Cyprus is not a secular position. He is ethnarch, not a president. This comes from the Turkish millet system and was is part of Greek canon law in that regard. Secondly, he has received no financial rewards or any kind of reward for this, other than almost near death every day. And third, because of that, it was a part of his ascetic labor. His sufferings were unimaginable, unimaginable here. This was not a job he took for money or power. So for that canon to ever be applied, the job has to have been taken for some nefarious reason. 
uh, the, the towering legal, legal minds of the Milan Synod had never heard of the Macarius case before. Um, but like Macarius, these were abstract canons written for very different circumstances. In this case, it was the Masonic Lodges, NATO and Britain, that were doing anything to get rid of this guy. And at the time, 1974, the ecumenical patriarch was a Freemason. But not only was Mercadios cleared, but the three bishops who brought the charge were defrocked. In other words, what they did was so blatantly political that they're the ones who are now in trouble. Does this sound familiar to you guys who know of my situation? I guess precedent doesn't really mean much to these people. The fact is, is that Mercadios fought off yet another attack, now from his own church. And it shows you how the Greek church in Cyprus was used by foreign powers and the heavy penetration of masonry, unfortunately, into the Greek church. Uh, and the lodges, of course, always on the side of Turkey against Greek nationalism. Um, and the two bishops who refused to attend were both uh, masons. So uh, assassination, slander, political coup, invasion, ecclesiastical coup, whatever they could, it all failed. Now, right up to today, 2018, uh, Turkey controls the northern part of Cyprus and calls it the Republic of Northern Cyprus. No one in the world recognizes it but Turkey. It is a failed state. It is an economically retarded state. Its GDP is maybe $2 billion. Um, and, of course, the currency over the, over the years has become worthless. It is a province of Turkey. Its entire economy is based on Turkish subsidies. And between 78 and 2011, Greek Cyprus exploded in, in economic growth. Per capita GDP reached $25,000, but on the Turkish part, it never went over 7000 And most of that comes from welfare payments from Turkey. We know unemployment is far higher than the 10% that they claim, and no one takes Turkish statistics in Cyprus very seriously. It's probably around 25%. The RNC, the Republic of Northern Cyprus, um, is simply a, a colony of Turkey. From 06 to 08, Turkey transferred almost $2 billion to the island in welfare payments. Almost all trade is with Turkey. The only thing they really produce is citrus fruits and, and some agricultural things subsidized by the Turks. Um, now, what happened in Cyprus was that they opened themselves open, to, opened themselves up to Israeli um, colonization. They claim that their their economy is growing rapidly, except that it's all on paper. The Turks and the Israelis came to an agreement to create a banking capital in the RNC that would function like the Swiss banks, like the Merchants Bank in Northern Cyprus, we have just mentioned, that were financing Goldberg. Because it was nothing more than a drug laundromat, it was eventually shut down. And so once the Merchant Bank was collapsed, the financial sector collapsed. So ultimately what it was, was like, it's like the Swiss Bank, or the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean. Um, you couldn't trace what was put there. So Jewish oligarchs the world over, whether it be from Russia or elsewhere, were pouring cash, uh, into, into Cyprus as a way to hide their assets. And this, the Turks claimed was economic growth for their part of the island. The other thing the Turks began doing was giving away land and selling homes at bargain prices. So it became this kind of Jewish oligarch-friendly environment where these guys could hide their income, hide their wealth um, in, in a non-transparent bank, in cheap real estate, way undervalued real estate. They created these, you know, gated communities and everything else. And But, you know, there is one area that the RNC has been successful, and that is prostitution. Just like all the other Islamic states, like Kosovo, Albania, prostitution is the only growth industry. Of course, the Israelis are in charge of this. Merchants Bank had financed it. Um, 90% of the girls are abducted from Eastern Europe. Half are from Moldova. And of course, sex traffic is legal, technically, in, um, or at least de facto, in Turkish Cyprus. Um, now the EU claims that, and the UN, you know, finally these people for once are correct, Northern Cyprus is nothing more than a Turkish occupation government. It is not recognized by anybody. Um, it's just a bit smaller, really, than the rest of 
Cyprus, but it's about 15, 20% of the economic side. The so-called service sector, I have big quotes there, uh, really the only two jobs you can have are, you know, pimp or government work. Because of the criminality of this so-called state, they stopped making economic records open to the public in 2012. Um, so this is, you know, this is what happened in Cyprus. So let me, let me summarize here briefly. Cyprus has a lot going for it. It has a tremendously intelligent, literate population. It has a great nationalist, a uh, very firm uh, identity, religious, conservative people. They really turned that place into the non-Turkish part of it, into absolutely uh, a beautiful, um, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, as most of you know. Um, the mil- Greek military junta was kind of on again, off again with Makarios. And the only thing that really they differed on was a gnosis, whether this should be one government or two. We know that joining with Greece at that time would have been a total disaster. And can you imagine now how bad it would have been? Cyprus has done well exactly because it didn't join with Athens, whether it be under the coup or not. The military was wrong in trying to overthrow Makarios, creating civil unrest. And ultimately, it led to the invasion of the island, and this, with tremendous Western pressure, collapsed the junta, and the coup collapsed in 1974. And now we have what's going on in Greece today. So Greece and northern Cyprus have all of that in common. I wanted to bring up the Jewish angle is extremely important. Um, and the Goldberg case and the Indiana, Indiana court, where the court finally did the right thing and said, you are essentially this, you know, a Jewish art thief who followed the Turks into this invasion with the purpose of committing cultural genocide in the area. Now, the Turkish army did this. Local Turks were armed by the Turks, Turkish army, and there were massacres all over the place. Most of the Greeks were thrown out. And the, and the churches were burned to the ground, and their treasures were um, confiscated and sold for a profit on the open market. Really, these Jews, as I said before, were destroying a lot of this. They could have been billionaires. They were billionaires already. But their hatred for Christianity was so intense, for orthodoxy was so intense, that they were melting down some of these things. And they would sell it. The gold, that's not nearly as, as, as valuable as these icons were. It was all fraud, all financed by the Merchants Bank in, in, in Turkish Cyprus, and was financed, of course, in the Goldberg organization, as well as the Israeli government. Um, and now, since then, of course... The Greek part of Cyprus has done very, very well. The Turkish part is just, just take the Turkish part of Cyprus is essentially the Kosovo of that part of the world. It's odd that wherever you know, European Muslims take over, Bosnia, Kosovo, Albania, northern Cyprus, the economy is exactly the same. Drugs, prostitution, criminality, so bad that now the Turks won't release any financial records after 2012 and creating kind of a Swiss bank idea for no other reason than to attract Jewish oligarchs from around the world to have this be a colony, not of Turkey, but of Israel. And that changed only because of the merchants' bank. The merchants' uh, bank collapsed because it has branches in the U.S. The Patriot Act was used to shut it down because there were drugs going through. Oh, any, any filthy organization you can imagine was using this bank. This bank was not a bank in a normal sense. It was a political institution used to hide uh, drugs, prostitution, white slavery uh, in the hands of of Israelis. That's what this was. So that's the situation in Cyprus. The junta was immensely successful, except in Cyprus, which turned out to be its undoing. Macarius III, I haven't dealt with him theologically because it's really not that important. He was a political figure through no fault of his own. I mean, he said to the so-called trial, he said... um, this is the position of ethnarch. Ethno-nationalism is not. And remember when people talk about this philatism nonsense, he was, his argument was accepted that ethno-nationalism was in fact a legitimate thing to be because he was ethnarch of Cyprus, not president. The stupid canon that, oh, you can't have a secular job. He said, well, it's not a secular job. And those canons only work if you're getting some kind of payment here. If you're getting, you know, attention, power, money, 
Obviously, that wasn't the case here. The man lived a very difficult life. Died in 1977. So let me conclude here. As far as the Junta is concerned, first of all, the Greek military moved in the late 1960s for a few reasons, as we all know. It moved to end the absurd stalemate in the Greek parliament, to stop the re-legalization of, of the Communist Party, and the liberals bringing in the socialists, as we mentioned, uh, was on the way to do that. Third, the failing economy was destroying Greece. Fourth, the military move because of the destruction of Greek Orthodox morals among the young population, especially from U.S. sources, especially music, especially corporate capitalism, protected by the American government, bringing this hippie garbage and this drug culture and all this uh, absolute openly satanic bands like um, Aphrodite's Child, um, you know, that use a 666 symbol everywhere. Uh, no. This is why, one of the reasons the, the, the coup occurred. Fifth, the military moved to take power to rescue the pathetic condition of the farmers, drowning in debt. Now, if these are the reasons, then the junta succeeded. We look at Greece today. Greece today is the direct result of the junta losing power when I was three years old. They were successful. The economy was going through the roof. Farmers were solid. Debt was zero. They kicked the bankers out when they forgave all of those debts. Can you imagine that happening now? Now, Cyprus. In the early 70s, the oil shock affected the Greek economy badly. The other reason that the coup failed. Cyprus has been in a state of war almost continuously since 1955. Several coups have occurred, one unsuccessful. The Turks were going to invade then, but UN intervention kept the Turks at bay. So there's always been this, this um, partition line that the UN Blue Helmets uh, patrol that tries to be as objective as they can be. As we mentioned, the first invasion force after Macarius was overthrown in 74 was defeated by the victorious Greeks. It shows you what nationalism can do. A handful of Greeks took on the second largest army in NATO and won Absolutely won. And they were so angry and humiliated that the second invasion led to the genocide of that part of the island. Since then, the UN has this green line that separates the two regions. But Cyprus is inherently Greek. The northern part of Cyprus is a de facto entity, not a country. It's a province of Turkey. It has no legitimacy. And believe it or not, the UN and the EU, we all agree on that. Cyprus has been very successful until the U.S. created the meltdown of 2008 through its Jewish banking establishment. The Israeli connection in northern Cyprus created only two functioning industries for a while. Banks that launder money from drug lords and, and pimps and prostitution. The Islamic sections of Europe are Jewish and they both do the same thing. Prostitution and drugs. Cyprus, Bosnia, Albania, Kosovo. There are no exceptions. It's almost like Jews use Muslims to take the fall for their crime. So we blame Muslims in Albania when it's in fact Israelis who are behind it. And the Muslims are a very easy target to take the fall. The fact is, Turks have no right to be in Cyprus. The Turkish Cypriots are remnants of the colonial force that occupied the area from 1570 on. Many are Greeks and Jews that either covertly or otherwise converted to Islam to avoid high taxes. And they could actually testify in court if they were Islamic. Macarius was right to advocate forcible repatriation. Because no one listened to him, the Turks did that for him in 1974 with far greater bloodshed by kicking the Greeks out. It was one or the other. He said so. And he was right. This is one of these examples, one of many, where stupid liberal policies cost thousands of lives and no one takes responsibility. The absurd charge of the EOKA assassination was deliberate and inflamed the hate against Cyprus by killing a U.S. diplomat, which shows just how far these people will go to distract attention from their failures. Cyprus and the Junta are really one and the same thing. Cyprus was a battleground where NATO and Britain could destroy Orthodox nationalism in favor of Turkish and Jewish investment. The record is genocide of Greeks and the stripping of the country. Once oil was discovered one year before the invasion, Jewish interests demanded the Turks take action and overthrow the junta in 
and the, and the British as well, overthrow the hunter in Athens. They got what they screamed for. The Jewish art dealers we talked about were acting at the behest of international powers. Diversity destroyed a country yet again. Yet again, affirmative action destroyed a country and paralyzed her government. But that was the point. Cyprus had the potential in British eyes to be a big navy base and to keep her poor and, of course, liberal and to make sure the Israelis could easily colonize it as they see fit. Only the Junta and Makarios, allies most of the time, stood in the way of this. Makarios had been largely washed from the history books because he was, in fact, a national socialist. He rejected both East and West, capitalism and communism, and sought a national solution to problems, a solution that's worked worldwide. I've dealt with on this show, I don't care if it's Belarus or South Korea, it's worked wherever it's tried. Keeping Greeks poor and stupid, keeping them enthralled to the U.S., which is the same thing as democracy, was the point of the Turkish invasion, the overthrow of Makarios, his canonical trial, and the raping of the island. Stealing icons was not just about Jewish hatred. It wasn't about making money. It was about destroying their life and their identity. Southeastern Europe, Britain always backed Jewish and Turkish interests. They're one and the same. The Northern Cyprus debacle is just proof of the evil of the anti-Greek forces, creating an absolute disgusting cesspool in one of the most beautiful places on earth. A Kosovo where both Islam and Judaism, one and the same, have destroyed half the island. A jewel of orthodoxy without question. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I appreciate your support in every way. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Donate to Father Matt Johnson at RussJournal.org. RUSJournal.org.